Good afternoon, Walter Reed and the Uniform Services University team and all of you who are joining us from around the National Capital Region and within the Defense Health Agency. On behalf of Colonel Kevin Chung, the Chair of Medicine at Uniform Services University, and myself, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Blaylock, the Chief of Medicine at Walter Reed, uh, we're incredibly happy that you can join us today for our first uh, virtual combined Walter Reed USU Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We're incredibly fortunate today to have Dr. Anthony Fauci, the Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases here with us. Uh, Dr. Fauci, I know you, you don't really need much of an introduction, but to suffice to say, you have been absolutely instrumental in our current uh, U.S. response to this global pandemic. We're incredibly fortunate to have you here with us today. Thank you for giving us some of your attention and discussing uh, the, uh, uh, the current ongoing research response to, to the COVID pandemic. So I'll hand the mic over to you and the, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Colonel. It's uh, really a pleasure uh, and a privilege to be here with you to address my colleagues at the Walter Reed National Medical Center and my colleagues at the Uniform Services University on this obviously very important, uh, compelling topic that we're all dealing with literally every day of our lives for the last several months. I'm gonna talk about COVID-19 and I'm gonna talk about some of the responses that we have. So in that regard, let's just get on with it. So as you see on the first slide, I'm gonna be talking about the disease itself and some of the things that we're doing about it. Um, I wrote an article in JAMA uh, in the, actually in the first week of January, it was published very soon thereafter. And I entitled it Coronavirus Infections More Than Just the Common Cold. I did not mean to be facetious, but I was trying to impress upon the readers that we have had experience with coronavirus for decades and decades and decades. As a matter of fact, if you look at this slide, which is the phylogenetic tree of coronaviruses, the four of the human coronaviruses are those that cause the common cold that account for about 15 to 30 percent of all the recurrent uh, common colds that we experience multiple times during our lives. In addition, uh, years ago, about 18 years ago, we had our first experience with the pandemic capability of coronaviruses with SARS coronavirus one, and then in 2012 with MERS coronavirus. And in fact, many of you remember the experience we had back in 2002, when we had a jumping of species from a bat to a civet cat um, to humans, leading to a pandemic outbreak of 8,000 individuals and close to 800 deaths with a 10% um, fatality rate. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, again, was a jumping of species from a bat to a camel to a human in Saudi Arabia, leading to mares of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. What we're dealing with today is the third of the pandemic human coronaviruses, as shown on this science title and a write-up from the Washington Post. The Chinese identified uh, a disease at the end of December, that's when they reported it, and a virus in the very beginning of January of 2020 of a strain of coronavirus that was the cause of a pneumonia outbreak that seemed to originate in a wet market in the central Chinese city of Wuhan. And getting back to the phylogenetic tree, as you can see, here's where SARS coronavirus 2 fits. We call it SARS coronavirus 2 because, as you can see from the tree, its proximity on the tree to SARS coronavirus 1 and much more distant to MERS coronavirus. Now, just for the sake of terminology, COVID-19 is what we refer to as the disease itself, coronavirus disease 2019. The viral etiology is what I just mentioned, SARS coronavirus 2. Fast forward now from that first week in January when the cluster of 20 plus cases were reported from China to where we are today with a historic, truly historic global pandemic that is the worst respiratory disease pandemic that we've had in 102 years 
since the now infamous pandemic flu of 1918. Currently, and this rises every single day, there are over 20 million cases and over 740 deaths globally. The United States, unfortunately for us, is a country that has hit the worst among all the countries in the world. Currently, with over 5 million cases and about 164,000 deaths scattered throughout the country, distributed in this blue heat map according to the various regions of the country. As we all know, we live in a very large country that is geographically, demographically, climactically, and otherwise diverse. And if you look at the part of the country that got hit the earliest and the worst was the Northeast, particularly dominated by the New York City metropolitan area. At a point back then, when there were about 50% of all cases, hospitalizations, and deaths were in the new Northeast part, particularly the New York metropolitan area. But as time went on, it shifted. As New York got control of this and got down to a good baseline, as you could see, the south part, the southern part of the country, the Midwest, and now the West are the dominating features that are driving the pandemic in the United States. Having said that, as a background of the fundamental epidemiology, let's take a look at some of the basic biology. As I mentioned, this is a beta coronavirus. It is an RNA virus. It has multiple structural proteins, the most important of which is the spike protein, shown schematically on the right-hand part of the slide. The spikes account for the crown-like appearance for which it gets its name, coronavirus. The receptor binding domain of that protein binds to an ACE2 receptor. That is a cellular receptor on cells distributed widely throughout the body, upper and lower respiratory tract, GI tract, and in some endothelial cells of blood vessels. This is a blown up picture of the cryo-EM structure of this spike in its pre-fusion conformation. This spike, which was described by my colleagues here at NIH, serves as the fundamental basis for all of the vaccines that are now being put into clinical trial. Uh, if not all, certainly most, one is the entire protein. In addition, the receptor has been identified, as I mentioned. It's the ACE2 receptor for the SARS coronavirus. Transmission now is pretty well delineated. As we all know, it's a respiratory-borne virus that's transmitted for close contact between individuals. Transmission is via particles that remain in the air. Some now most recently have shown to be aerosol remaining in the air for more than just a few seconds. It can be found on infected surfaces, as well as in other body fluids, such as stool, blood, semen, ocular secretions. But the role of those body fluids in transmission is unknown. And animals have been reported to be infected, but their source of human infection is doubtful and very unlikely. This is just a schematic diagram of what happens when someone sneezes or coughs as you see by the refraction of this light, how the respiratory droplets can go a fair distance to someone in close contact. The risk of transmission really varies on the type and the duration of exposure. Secondary infections are most common among household contacts, people in congregations or settings, cruise ships, nursing homes, prisons, meatpacking facilities. There have been a number of clusters of cases that have been reported after social or work gatherings, which highlight the risk of the transmission through close non-household contact in the workplace and elsewhere. Here's an example of the now famous Skagit County, Washington choir infection, when one individual who was symptomatic infected 87% of the group of individuals who were in the choir. Again, underscoring the importance of wearing, of avoiding crowds, 
and of outdoors always being much better than indoors. There have been other issues of super spreading events, family gatherings in Chicago, events at a church in Arkansas, always situations, mostly indoors, where individuals congregate without masks. Here's another example of a meat processing plant. Many of these are now closing because of individuals who've been infected in those particular areas. It is unclear whether it is in the plant or in the housing that's provided by many of these migrant workers of individuals who are there and the crowding in their housing. Whatever it is, it's close physical contact. Now, there are some personal preventive measures that as individuals we can do. And I'll go through them, and I've said them so many, many times in other discussions, but it's worth repeating. Diligent hand washing with soap and water for 20 seconds or with hand sanitizers if available. Avoiding close contact at least six feet. Wearing a face covering, a mask, or a cloth covering. Cover your sneezes and coughs. Avoid face touching. And do regular cleaning and disinfecting of objects, which may, after a few hours, still have viable virus on them. There are also public health measures, namely mandates from public health officials, such as social distancing, stay at home, lockdown, or shelter in place orders modifying the schedule or closing school venues, non-essential business, bans on public gatherings, particularly things indoors and bars. Bars are a very hot spot for transmission. There have been travel restrictions both ways, in and out of the country, as well as the typical things we do with identification, isolation, and contact tracing of infected individuals. What about the clinical manifestations. I must say, this is an extraordinary disease. We know the median of the incubation period is about five days with a range of two to 14. If you look at the presenting symptoms, it looks very much like a flu-like syndrome. One of the things that's a bit different is that a considerable number of individuals present with a loss of smell and taste that actually precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms. But here's the part that is so confusing to some and so unique in my now many decades experience with emerging respiratory infections. And that is the extraordinary breadth of the kinds of spectrum of disease from 30 to 40% of individuals, as I'll get to in a moment, who have no symptoms to some with mild illness that may not even have them go to bed, even though they should stay home. Others confined to bed for weeks, but not requiring hospitalization. Others requiring hospitalization, some with intensive care, some with intubation, some with ventilation, and some with death, particularly among a subset of individuals that I'll mention in a moment. And that's probably one of the reasons why individuals who never get any symptoms feel incorrectly, but understandably, that this is a trivial disease, which in a subset of individuals, it's not. And as a matter of fact, as I mentioned just a moment ago, up to 45% of individuals are without symptoms. However, we thought early on, but we are now convinced that asymptomatic individuals and pre-symptomatic individuals are quite capable of transmitting infection to someone who is close by and not infected. That is one of the most perplexing and confounding components of the identification, isolation, and contact tracing. Getting back to the breadth of the disease, mild to moderate disease dominates with more than 81% of individuals. Those with severe disease, and critical disease, depending upon your age and your underlying condition, have a much higher fatality rate, some up to about 20% who go into intensive care and require ventilation. The manifestations of disease, many of us now are very familiar with it, usually acute respiratory distress syndrome, 
a hyperinflammatory response. There are now many more case reports of cardiac injury, kidney injury, neurological disorders, including thromboembolic complications, anywhere from microthrombi up through large vessel thrombi, including stroke. And then the very curious multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, usually a week or so after the initiation of symptoms of the disease, resembling very closely what we know of as Kawasaki syndrome. Now, people at increased risk for severe infection are older adults and people of any age with certain underlying conditions. Regarding older adults, the data are very clear. If you look at the rate of, of, of hospitalization per 100,000 population, very unusual, though not impossible at all, for children to have severe enough disease to require hospitalization. But as you go from young adults up to the elderly, you can see a dramatic rise in the rate per 100,000 population for hospitalizations. People of any age with certain underlying medical conditions, again, those in which the evidence is strong for an increased risk are shown here. Heart conditions, kidney disease, obstructive pulmonary disease, type two diabetes. Obesity is very important. Cancer with underlying immunosuppression and other types of immunocompromising. Those conditions that may confer increased risk, not as dominating as the other, are shown on this slide. I need not mention all of them except put, to point out to you some of them that clearly are dominant. And that is hypertension, as well as cerebrovascular and chronic lung disease and immunocompromised individuals. Racial and ethnic disparities are clearly very obvious. The most pervasive among a minority population of African Americans, Latinx, and American Indian and Alaskan Natives and Pacific Islanders. That's shown very clearly on this slide. When you look again at the rate per 100,000 for hospitalization, take a look at one of these, Black non-Hispanics are at least five times more likely to be hospitalized than whites when you compare 277 to 59. Diagnostics, there are three types. The molecular test, which uses a PCR for the virus itself. The antigen test, which we can now upscale in the sense of doing many, many at a time, detect proteins from the virus, not as sensitive as the molecular test, but nonetheless very good for screening. And then there's the antibody the test that doesn't test for the virus, but tests actually for antibody response to the virus. Now interventions, therapeutics. Right now, the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines panel has recommended two drugs, and I'll get back to them in a moment, remdesivir and dexamethasone, for use in certain patients. Others are being tested now, many of which are in randomized placebo-controlled trials, such as direct antivirals, convalescent plasma, hyperimmune globulin, monoclonal antibodies, immune modulators and interferons, as well as adjunct therapies like anticoagulants for the thromboembolic phenomenon that I mentioned a moment ago. Let's take a look quickly at some of the therapies that are now recommended. Remdesivir, which is a direct antiviral, in a randomized placebo-controlled trial of over 1,000 individuals, an international study showed a highly significant but modest effect in diminishing the time to recovery in individuals who are A, hospitalized, and B, requiring oxygen. Then you go to dexamethasone, another group from the UK, a randomized placebo-controlled trial, which showed that individuals on ventilators or requiring oxygen had a significant improvement in diminishing the mortality rate. Of note, it was not only not effective in early infection, it actually looked like it hurt a bit and caused some harm. 
which goes along very, very nicely with our concept of the pathogenesis of this very pleomorphic disease. And that is early on, you want to stop the virus, but not interfere with the immune response. Whereas later on, although the virus still is important, the pathogenic mechanisms are dominated by an inappropriate hyperinflammatory response, which clearly was diminished by the administration of dexamethasone. This is the guideline panels that I mentioned. It's a living document that analyzes data in real time and is updated very frequently. For those of you who want to find out what some of these recommendations are, easy access, you just go and link COVID-19 treatment guidelines.nih.gov. And finally, vaccines. A lot of activity going on with vaccines. Some time ago, a few months ago, my colleagues and I published in a commentary in science our strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine R&D. What we meant is that what we did was take about six companies of which we have to a greater or lesser degree, directly or indirectly, involved in either developing or facilitating the trials of these different platforms of vaccines. And the uh, strategic approach is to harmonize to the extent possible the protocols themselves, a common data and safety monitoring board, common primary, secondary, and tertiary endpoints, and common immunological parameters to measure and compare. This is a list of the various candidates broken up into platform, three major platforms, nucleic acid like messenger RNA, viral vectors like VSV, uh, chimp adeno, and human adeno, and the typical protein subunits. Two of these that are supported by the NIH, actually one that is directly developed by the NIH, went into phase three on July 27th simultaneously with the Pfizer product. Soon thereafter, you will then see another product from AstraZeneca. And then as we get into the late summer and early fall, some of these others will enter into a phase three trial. We hope and anticipate that we will have an answer as to the safety and efficacy as we come to the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. Again, as many of you know, you can never guarantee the success of a efficacious and safe vaccine, but we are cautiously optimistic that we will have one or more given the rather favorable data in phase one showing the induction of robust titers of neutralizing antibody, which are generally predictive of a favorable response. Again, let me close by letting people know that, in fact, if you want to enlist, enroll, or at least express, express an interest in getting involved in some of these clinical trials, I encourage you to go to coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org and you could take a look at what's available and put down what you might be interested in. I will stop there and be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, for uh, providing an outstanding overview of this pandemic and some of our research endeavors uh, to date. Uh, so as you can imagine, we've received several questions from around the military medical community, and I really appreciate you taking a short period of time to address some of them. Uh, so particularly leading into the fall, uh, one of the uh, most concerning issues that we're all struggling with, I think, as a society is how to effectively and safely bring children back into the classroom. Uh, and so I really would be interested in hearing your thoughts on are there particular metrics that we should look at across the country to do this safely and um, what you think about um, how we can do this appropriately? Okay, a great question, Colonel. It's asked consistently now as we get into the middle of the summer and approaching the beginning of the fall terms. So first of all, you got to take a look at what your default position is. And the default position is that you should try, try to the best of our ability to get the children back to school because we know from the American Academy of Pediatrics 
that it's important that when children are not in school, there are deleterious consequences that are psychological. And even in some parts of the country, children depend on school for a nutrition of breakfast and lunch. And also there's the secondary uh, spin-off downstream unintended consequences on families who have to interrupt work to be able to take care of the children. But having said that, the underlying predominant driving factor is the safety, the health, and the welfare of the children and of the teachers. Now, having said that, we live in a big country, and their country is very heterogeneous, geographically, demographically, but importantly, Colonel, it's differ with regard to the level of infection in the community. And we have now designations like green, which means less than 5% test positivity and less than 10 individuals per 100,000 who are infected. Then there's yellow, which is 5 to 10% infection uh, um, uh, uh, case positivity with 10 to 100 cases per 100,000. And then there's red, which is greater than 10% positive on testing and greater than 100 per 100,000 individuals. You've got to look at where you are. If you're in the green zone, with somewhat impunity, you can feel good about sending kids back. If you're in a yellow zone, you've got to make sure the schools have the capability of mitigating any risk of infection. Wearing masks, separating desks, outdoors more than indoors, opening windows where possible, having susceptible children be online, alternating days, morning, afternoon, et cetera. Mm -hmm. If you're in a red zone, I think you really better be careful and try to get your county, your city, your state down to a yellow or green to get the children in. The best way to open the schools is to get where you live closer to the green than to the red. That sounds incredibly reasonable, Dr. Fauci. And the bottom line is we got to be flexible. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, sir, another uh, more controversial issue that has come up across our medical uh, systems in the country is the utility of actually taking temperature checks at all entry points for every visitor, every provider, every uh, patient coming into the hospital. You showed some uh, metrics about, you know, the likelihood of fever presenting with uh, COVID infection. Has there been any demonstrated utility that you're aware of to capturing COVID-19 infection coming in the doors of hospitals uh, by actually taking temperatures? You know, Colonel, this is going to disappoint a lot of people by saying this, but the answer is no. <laughs> the benefit is marginal. We have found at the NIH that it is much, much better to just question people when they come in and save the time uh, because the temperatures are notoriously inaccurate many times. So at the NIH Clinical Center across the street from you guys and at the White House where I go in every day, we've abandoned entry of a um, uh, determination of temperature for the following reason. It's in the middle of the summer. We've had like, what, 15 days, 90 degrees in a row? <laughs> so I went into the White House the other day. My temperature was like 103 <laughs> until I took it in the air-conditioned car, and it was 97.4. When I tried to get into another facility, my temperature was 93, which means I should have been on a respirator. So <laughs> I, I think we got to just abandon that and say, let's just be prudent, ask questions, and do it that way. Well, uh, again, I think that sounds incredibly reasonable, Dr. Fauci, and we, we kind of had the same uh, thoughts over at Walter Reed as well, so it's very reassuring to hear you uh, echo that as well. Um, so I know you're aware that over the past month, the CDC has uh, altered their recommendations for transmission or removal of transmission-based precautions. And one of the uh, things that they changed were actually now recommending against retesting somebody who was initially testing positive within a three-month window. Uh, so are, are we pretty comfortable now that, uh, that there's no known cases of true reinfection of COVID? Or are you aware of any uh, true cases out there in the, in the nation? 
Uh, so, Colonel, it has been purely rare and anecdotal. And every anecdotal case I've seen, there could have been another explanation for that. So I can say, although we have to leave open the possibility, because as you know as well as I do, in biology, you know, there's never 100%. But it is likely so, so rare that right now, with what we know, we can say it's not an issue. But since we're, we're, in, we're all of us, you and I and all of your colleagues there, are involved in an evolving situation, we have to be humble enough and honest enough to realize that as we gain more data, this could change. But based on what we know today, at the end or middle of August, that there does not appear to be any indication that that's occurring. Right. Um, sir, do we have any insight into the SARS-CoV-2 virus's ability to mutate at all? And if so, uh, what effect might that have on some of our leading vaccine candidates? Good, good question. Well, it's an RNA virus, Colonel, so it absolutely mutates. There's no doubt. The question is, are these mutations that are associated with a phenotypic change? In other words, does genetic change equal phenotypic change. Most mutations in an RNA virus do not have any functional consequences. We do know, and this is important, that there have been now uh, an association of a mutation of one amino acid to another at position 614 that leads to a better binding to the ACE2 receptor, which hints that it is going to be much easier to transmit. We need to get more definitive indication of that. I think it might actually be the case, but we don't know. We've got to be careful. The one thing we did do is we took the structural confirmation and looked at where the mutation was, and it doesn't seem at all to interfere with any of the antibodies that are important that are being induced by the vaccine. So it may make something a bit more transmissible, but it doesn't negatively impact the vaccine issue. Uh -huh. That's very interesting to hear. So uh, do you, uh, when we look at kind of our current leading vaccine candidates, uh, do we have any sense of the, how long they might confer immunity for? Our... You know, the answer is no. Uh, and that we'll, we'll find that out. But the reason we don't know it now is that we've given the vaccine in a phase one study and a phase two study, which was just a couple of months ago. So we know it lasts a couple of months, whether it's three months, six months, a year, a year and a half, we just don't know. And that's one of the things we've got to be transparent. We are hoping that it lasts a full cycle of a season so that you could protect. And if in fact it wanes, you can actually give a boost. And that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping we get sustained immunity, but if we don't, I think we can easily use a boost to bring it back up. Okay. So Dr. Fauci, one of the things that we have seen throughout this pandemic is there's a certain cohort of patients who will just remain persistently PCR positive for outwards of you know weeks after initial uh, PCR positivity. And so a handful of these folks are essential, uh, mission essential workers throughout the United States, healthcare workers. Are we pretty comfortable now with the updated CDC guidance saying once you've been positive, identified for 10 days and your symptoms have resolved, uh, that it's okay for you to go back to work and head back out into the community? Or should we be looking at looking at adjunct uh, testing like serologic testing to help us really confirm that? or even looking at PCR cycle thresholds uh, to confirm somebody's ability to come back into the workplace? You know, what's being done right now is, is each day and week that goes by, we become more confident that the CDC recommendation of 10 days from the onset of symptoms works. What we've done at the NIH is that we've taken a look at cycle threshold and we found that anything 35 cycles or higher, we have never seen a case of replication-competent virus. So if you want to do it, the, the cycle threshold, 
and you get a cycle threshold of 37, you are good to go. Or 36, you are good to go. Great. Uh, so, sir, as we head into the flu season, you know, there, there are some uh, multi-array uh, assays coming out that are looking at, you know, co co combining flu A and B with SARS-CoV uh, PCR testing. Do you have a recommended approach to how, you know, our medical facilities should really approach the diagnostics for depicting, you know, between flu A or B and other respiratory viruses and COVID? COVID uh, infection as we head into the uh, respiratory season here? Yeah. You know, I think if we, by the time we get to the fall, if we have a multiplex assay that can actually do both, and that's highly sensitive and specific, we're investing a lot of money, Colonel. I mean, like a half a billion dollars were put into the RADx for the diagnosis of COVID. We should be able to, in real time, I hope, a point of care diagnostic that will tell you right there as you're waiting whether or not you have one, the other, or both, or none. And I think that we could be there. And if that's the case, it certainly would be worth doing. Great. That's, that's really reassuring to hear, sir. So uh, you mentioned briefly about the rapid antigen uh, testing. And so there are some issues with sensitivity, but it might be uh, a good screening uh, mechanism. Could you clarify where you see that role for yeah. a rapid SARS-CoV-2 yeah. antigen? Absolutely, and I think you said it quite correctly. The, the rapid uh, high throughput antigen tests, depending upon which one it is, are clearly not as sensitive as is the PCR molecular test, which is like 98, 99%. This varies, you know, sometimes as low as 50 or as high as 75, 80, 85. The lack of sensitivity is made up for by the fact if you're doing it to screen, you likely are doing it more than once. So some institutions are trying to say, listen, I got a group that goes into a big restaurant or a big essential situation. I want to know every other day, whether they are positive or not. Okay. That, that frequency of surveillance makes up for the lack of sensitivity. And I, I'm an example of that. So yesterday, I got my 40th rapid test, <laughs> which means every time I go into the White House, uh, you've got to get tested. So it, even though the test is 85% sensitive, the fact is, if you do it almost every single day or three times a week, four times a week, you can be pretty sure that sooner or later, if you're infected, they're going to find out. You're not going to miss much. All right. Well, it's a good thing those tests seem to be uh, cheaper too. So, Great. <laughs> uh, so sir, uh, when it comes to uh, determining a correlate of protection against uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, do we, wh wh a lot of focus has been on serologic testing and antibody uh, response, humoral immunity. Um, is there a decent role though for assessing for T-cell immunity as a correlate yeah. of protection? The answer is absolutely yes. In fact, there is a lot of hot stuff, Colonel, as it is going on right now in some recent papers which have showed some fascinating things that people who don't seem to have high titers of antibodies, but who are infected, have been infected, mm -hmm. have good T cell responses. And those who you didn't think got infected have T cell responses. Even those who could not have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 because the bloods were drawn a year and a half ago show they have cross-reacting T cells, which means good news that it may be that the long acting T cell responses that you might have, not everybody, that you might have from previous common cold coronaviruses that cross react with the immunity that, I mean, will cross react with the virus you're having now could actually give you a degree of protection. Might actually explain, maybe this is a hypothetical, that children don't get significant disease even though they get infected. 
may be that they got a recent coronavirus infection and they're partially protected, not from infection, but from disease. Oh, that's, that's very interesting to, to hear that. Um, so, Dr. Fauci, one final question for you. So you, you briefly mentioned COVID convalescent plasma, and I was wondering if, uh, um, is there pretty good evidence for benefit of using COVID convalescent plasma for treatment of COVID-19 infection? It is suggestive, not definitive. And right wow. now, the FDA is carefully looking at some data from non-placebo controlled trials that were given on an expanded access program. Right now, I would say within the next two weeks at the latest, we'll know whether there is indication of efficacy. If not, then we'll have to wait for the randomized placebo controlled trial. But the direct answer to your question is that there is suggestive evidence that is protective early, early in infection, not late, right? So, so with regards to the timing of administration, uh, perhaps as early as possible an onset of infection might be uh, beneficial. I don't okay. know for sure, Colonel, but I would imagine, and uh, this is my you know, guess, uh, but a, a guess based on, you know, I think some reasonable understanding is that okay. the best way to do it is when you okay. first come in, know you're infected to protect you from going, requiring hospitalization. I foresee it perhaps as an outpatient infusion, the same way as you would get, uh, you know, your blood drawn or donating a blood, getting an infusion of it on an outpatient basis. Dr. Fauci, what do you think about the potential for pre or post exposure prophylaxis then with use of CCP? Oh, I mean, I, I think that convalescent plasma could be used for that. Uh, I would think that what we're doing right now, apropos of your question, is collecting convalescent plasma and making hyperimmune globulin. Because the, 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 the weak point of convalescent plasma that the tide is very all over the place. And you don't know if it's neutralizing, whether it's neutralizing. Whereas if you get a bunch of these and make very well titrated hyperimmune globulin, you could come in and say, okay, we know in a study that X number of grams gives you protection for three months. The same way that we used to do with hepatitis. Remember before the vaccine, you would mm -hmm. give hyperimmune globulin. Same thing. Okay. That's great to hear, Dr. Fauci. So uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I, I know it's very precious nowadays, uh, but really want to thank you uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come address our military medical community. Uh, on behalf of Colonel Barr, the director of Walter Reed, I do want to present you virtually at least uh, with a token uh, of, of our appreciation. I'll make sure I clean this off and wipe it down good and get it into your hands at some point. Uh, also from Dean Kellerman at the Uniform Services University, uh, I do have another coin uh, as well here, a USU coin uh, that I'll also give you. Uh, sir, really appreciate all the time you've given us today. Thank you so much for your leadership and your wisdom and really for being a resounding voice of scientific reason throughout this entire pandemic. Uh, I know our military medical community is greatly indebted to you for your service. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Colonel. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And hello to all my colleagues across the street. <laughs> all right. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. These, these aren't very good. I know. I'll get you done. They fall off. I, I like to stand on them. Grab them back. It's one.